All right. Good evening and welcome to the January installment of the 2022 Field Archaeology Series on Thursday or FAST. My name is Buck Robertson and I am this year's FAST coordinator. Every month, FAST features a public facing lecture presenting the latest in archaeological research from University of Michigan students, faculty, and researchers. FAST is generously supported by the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology, the Department of Classical Studies, the Interde Interdepartmental Program in Classical Art and Archaeology, and for this month, the University of Michigan uh, Museum of Anthropological Archaeology. But FAST is ultimately made possible by an eager and engaged audience and world-class speakers. Before we begin, I would like to thank everyone in attendance and ask your patience in the event of any complications which may arise from the virtual format. I also ask that you please remain muted for the duration of the lectures. We will welcome all questions at the end of our panel of speakers this evening. But without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce this month's FAST speakers, Dr. Mike Galati, Irina uh, Batsi, uh, and Janetta Gishia. Uh, apologize if I'm missing you, uh, your name, um, whose collective lecture is entitled uh, Preliminary Interpretations of Settlement in Prehistoric Kosovo, uh, Results of the Rapid K Survey, 2018 to 2021. Mike is a professor of anthrop uh, anthropology and classical studies here at the university and is director and curator of European and Mediterranean archaeology at the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology. He is also the co-director of the regional archaeology in the Peya and Istog districts of Kosovo project, or Rapid K, uh, and will be our first speaker this evening. Mike will provide some background to the project and its goals. Next will be Irina Abatsi, a fourth year doctoral student in anthropological archaeology. Irina is the GIS uh, database manager uh, and she will speak on her research regarding the role of hill forts in shaping settlement patterns in the late Bronze Age to early Iron Age in the rapid study area. Finally, uh, Janetta uh, Gishia uh, will close us out this evening. Janetta is a second year doctoral student in anthropological archaeology and a team leader on the project. And she will speak on the late Neolithic site, which her team has focused on. Uh, and with that, I'll hand that over to Mike. Thanks, Buck. Um, give me one second here, folks, while I get the uh, PowerPoint going. All right. Well, thanks everyone for being here on this Thursday evening. And thanks, Buck, for that fine introduction. Um, I also wanna take a moment and thank um, the people of Kosovo for welcoming us to their their country and letting us do archaeology there. Uh, I especially want to thank my colleagues at the Institute of Archaeology in Kosovo, um, and especially Haji Mehmetai and Dukajin Mehmetai. Um, our project couldn't um, happen without them and their, their collaboration. Um, so thanks to everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, like Buck said, I'm going to take a few minutes and introduce you to our project, and then Johnny will talk about the late Neolithic site of Luga, where she's working, and Arena um, will talk about Hillfords. Um, so yeah, the name of our project is Rapid K. Um, it is a collaboration with the Institute of Archaeology and the country of Kosovo. Um, and uh, I first uh, started thinking about this project in 2016. Uh, my wife, Sylvia, who many of you know, is from Kosovo, and she's also an archaeologist. Uh, and we visited the um, country and uh, saw great potential for doing archaeology there. Um, so we've now done three field seasons, um, summers of 2018, 19, and then 2021. Took a break in 2020 for um, uh, due to COVID. Um, like I said, the project is co-directed um, with my wife, Sylvia. Uh, but also with Haji Mehmetai, who is an archaeologist, prehistorian from um, Kosovo, from the Institute of Archaeology. We've had funding uh, from the university, but also from the National Geographic Society and from the Institute itself. Um, and we're also very lucky to have strong partnerships with the University of Pristina and the University of Tirana in Albania, both um, of which have provided undergraduate and graduate students who have worked on the project. So that's been an excellent collaboration for us. Um, RAPID began um, as in part a response to the work we had been doing in Northern Albania. 
um, both in the vicinity of Shkoder, the Pash project, the Proyecti Archaeologique Yishkodres, um, and then the Shala Valley project um, up in the high mountains, um, up in the Albanian Alps. Um, and uh, we've, we've already published SVP um, and we're working on publishing the Posh project. Uh, and what we realized is that the folks living um, down close to um, like Skoder along the coast, but also work, uh, living up in the high mountains um, were uh, connected with one another, but also seemed to be reaching across the mountains into the interior through um, uh, patterns of exchange, um, both of items, but also probably people moving back and forth. So once we had finished our work in the mountains and down near Skoder, um, we figured it was a logical next step to work across the mountains um, on the interior in, um, in Kosovo. So RAPID is um, kind of a third phase here of work we've been doing for, for a couple of decades in North Albania. Um, and, uh, and, and is an important phase in the work because uh, we want to know especially whether settlement patterns in, um, in the region of Skoder and North Albania generally are, are very different from or similar to what we find on the interior in Kosovo and whether things were happening at the same times or in very different ways in both places. Um, so now with three years of work in Kosovo, we do now feel like we're in a, in a position to start uh, making those comparisons and drawing those connections um, between North Albania, um, closer to the Adriatic and on the interior in Kosovo. Um, the method we're using is one that many of you are familiar with. Um, it's intensive regional archeological survey. So we essentially um, uh, have begun our project by um, walking the fields, um, looking for artifacts looking for sites um, and then putting those sites and artifacts on the map and thereby getting some sense of where people were living at different times in the past, beginning in pre prehistory and then right down um, to the present. Um, and uh, um, we've, we've had great results so far. As it turns out, there's lots of archeology span on the surface in Western Kosovo and uh, there's lots to find. So um, we've been quite pleased with the results so far. Um, we have now, over the course of three summer seasons, surveyed um, about 17 square kilometers in 3,437 tracks, survey tracks. You can see them on the map here, color-coded by year. Um, in the course of doing survey, we've discovered approximately 50 new sites um, dating to all periods of the past. Of those sites, 15 are prehistoric um, or have prehistoric components. This is in addition to um, the sites that had already been discovered in this part of Kosovo, Kosovo by Kosovar archeologists. Um, and so what we have is a very heavily settled landscape in all periods, most periods. Um, there's a very strong prehistoric component um, and then a very uh, strong uh, Roman presence in the region. Um, and the majority of artifacts we find actually are from the medieval period. It's a really fascinating um, growth and settlement during the medieval period. But tonight we're gonna focus primarily on the prehistoric results of the project. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing at a site called Pepi. Um, which dates to the late Bronze Age. And then, um, like I said, Arena and um, Johnny will look at other periods and other sites. So, uh, like I said, we, it's a very densely occupied landscape and we find all kinds of artifacts on the surface. We find tons of pottery, both prehistoric and for multiple periods. Um, you can see that we also find um, quite a few lithics. We have yet to find good evidence for uh, Paleolithic and Mesolithic in the region. Uh, maybe it's up in the hills and the caves, but so far the survey hasn't turned up much from those periods. Um, lots of Neolithic, here's a Neolithic um, ax. Uh, and so, um, so it's, it's really um, been almost overwhelming the amount of artifacts uh, we've found. Um, and uh, here's a map of the tracks we've surveyed again. And this is a density map showing places we've 
found prehistoric material. So you can see these red spots, these red flashes of prehistoric settlement. And we're gonna focus in though on this part of our study region around a village called Vrel and in an area called Lubojd. And you can see the blow up here. In this area, we um, identified a very large late Bronze Age site in our first season of research in 2018, where we've continued to work. And that's the site, Pepe, that I'll be talking about uh, more in a minute. Um, but we also located quite nearby um, a very large, um, previously un um, identified late Neolithic site called Luga. That's the site that Johnny will talk about. Um, what's really interesting about Pepe is that it is a flat site. So it's down here at the base of the foothills um, and it has an accompanying um, hill fort, which we call Gradine, which is above, um, you know, quite steep up on uh, the top of the hill above Pepe. Um, and then down here, um, further out into the plains, there's a set of tumuli, burial mounds. So this is a rare situation where we have not just a hill fort and tumuli, but also a very large um, flat site associated. Um, so we're quite interested in, in Pepe itself for that reason. Um, so uh, um, Arena has been doing work at Gradine, and she'll talk a little bit about that site. Um, and then She'll also talk about a site called Jateti, um, which is located out here to the east, right on the edge of our study, uh, study region. Um, and uh, this site is a hill fort as well. Um, uh, and it dates to the Bronze Age and Iron Age. And that's, uh, that's a site where Arena has also been working. So she'll talk about that site. So on to Pepe. Um, we discovered Pepe in 2018, uh, and we found copious amounts of prehistoric pottery on the surface. This was partly the result of construction of houses. Um, a, a number of new houses had been built post-war uh, in the vicinity uh, of the hill fort and had turned up a lot of pottery. You can see that some pieces of pottery are quite large, having been brought up um, from, uh, from underneath the ground. Um, and so this drew our attention to the site. Uh, also, um, in the process of constructing houses, um, a cut had been made into the site, uh, revealing this profile, this soil profile, which um, was chock full of, of pottery and other kinds of artifacts. Uh, so in 2018, before they built um, what eventually became a large garage into this, into this uh, construction site, we were able to go to it and sample that, that cut, um, that profile, and um, we took a series of radiocarbon samples from the profile, four of them. Uh, one of them was close to the surface, which returned um, a late medieval date. And indeed, there's a large late medieval presence at the site. Um, uh, probably is the ancestral village of the people who live there today, some of whom are Serbs, some of whom are Albanians. Uh, and so there's a, there seems to be a fairly large medieval site over the top of the prehistoric occupation. And then further down in the profile, we took samples at 100 centimeters, 120, 140. Those returned AMS rated carbon dates um, between 1400 and 1200 BC. Um, and so we think that indeed Pepe is a late Bronze Age um, to early Iron Age site. Um, very large and um, very dense. So here you can see a satellite view of the region. Those radiocarbon samples were taken up here. The hill fort of Gradine, where Arena is working, is up the, up the hill here. The red line outlines um, roughly the boundaries of the site where we found fairly relatively dense um, uh, pottery remains over the course of survey. And then this blue line kind of marks the core of the site. And we decided in 2019 <clears throat> that we would do some shovel testing. Shovel testing is, a, is an approach that, a method that's quite common here in North America, but is rarely employed in the Balkans. Um, and so we decided to, um, to uh, do some shovel testing at Pepe. Um, here you can see my colleague Haji, the co-director of the project, working with students um, from the field school in 2019, digging these shovel tests. Um, and here's a map of those, um, of those shovel tests. So each one of these black dots 
is on a 20 meter grid. Um, we dug from surface to subsurface, screened all artifacts, collected all artifacts. And um, these are the results of that shovel testing. Um, and you can see that in some places we were finding extremely uh, large numbers of prehistoric pottery. So in this case down here with the, the large red circle, literally out of the, the small half meter um, shovel test, we were finding uh, you know, upwards of hundreds of, of pieces of pottery um, and uh, lots of bone, lots of other kinds of small finds and artifacts. Um, like I said, there's clearly a historic, a medieval occupation there as well, um, but definitely a density of artifacts uh, at the site uh, that makes it a strong candidate for future excavations, um, where we would hope to learn something more about this site in particular and the late Bronze Age in Western Kosovo generally, um, and then how it relates to what we've discovered in North Albania. This area in particular um, right here at the center of the shovel testing produced um, uh, quite, quite rich um, amounts of, of archaeology. So last summer in 2021, um, I invited my colleague Apostolo Saris, who's at the University of Cyprus, who's a geophysicist, to come and do some magnetometry work at the site. Um, he also then uh, subsequently did uh, geophysics at Luga and at the Hillforts, so arena and Johnny will talk about the results um, of magnetometry work at those sites as well. What Apostolos found was unfortunately some of these northern parts of the site here um, where you can see a lot of interference were quite disturbed probably during the medieval period but also through modern building. Um, and so these areas up here where we found quite a few artifacts are, are pretty disturbed but off the edge of what might have been the medieval site down here in these fields, we found several targets, um, several anomalies that might um, prove interesting to excavate in the future. And you can see that these in the middle portions of the magnetometry survey correspond quite closely to the dense um, artifact uh, distributions here at the center of the shovel testing. Um, so those are the areas where we'll probably look to excavate in the future. Um, so the Late Bronze Age um, site of Pepai is interesting. The Late Bronze Age in general in the region is of great interest to us, especially in comparison to what we found in North Albania. And um, I think I'm now turning it over to Jani, who's going to talk about the Late Neolithic, um, the uh, precursor to the Bronze Age in um, the region. Um, and so just to finish up, here's our team in 2021. We couldn't do it without them. Um, many of the people on the, uh, watching the presentation today were on the field team in 2021. So thank you for your hard work. If you want to check out our website, you can find it at um, Kosovo Archaeology, um, umich.edu. And we have a, um, a relatively active Instagram account at Kosovo Archaeology. So thank you very much. That's a very quick and dirty introduction to Rapid K. Um, and some of our prehistoric results. And Johnny, I'm gonna disappear now and, and stop sharing my screen and let you take over. Thank you, Mike. You share my screen. Hello, everyone. My name is Janetta, and as Bak said, I am a second year <laughs> student at the UMA. Uh, and uh, I will be discussing the work that we did at the late Neolithic site that Mike just mentioned. And uh, I will talk a little bit about the site location, collection method that we have used so far, discuss a little bit the findings, some future research goals and acknowledgement. And here is the uh, a site, a view of the site. So site Luga is located in the Vrela village in an alluvial field in the Dugagini Plain with a cursed mount in the north. It has an area of three hectares and the site is bounded, bounded by a little creek, creek in the north, near which also is a fresh water spring, which locals still use. Within the site, there are some cement drainage channels 
The opening of these channels and frequent flying might explain the high density of the artifact on the surface. With the preliminary of which of numerous of those artifacts that I will discuss today recovered during the project, including stone tools and ceramics, suggest that the site was occupied at least since the late Neolithic and continued in use into the Bronze Age and down to medieval times. And uh, the site is located in the lower level of the Dugagini Plain, surrounded by the accursed mound in the north, and then by the Dugagini Plain in the south. And uh, here is where the site is located, all these fields that are very red, it's all the surface of the site. And uh, first, we did the pedestrian survey in 2019, where we, when we discovered the site. Due to dense vegetation at that time, we were able to survey only a part of the site, a total of two tracts. And uh, we went back in 2021 and surveyed the remaining fields. And now we have a total of seven tracts, which cover the whole three hectares. And uh, during this year, we, last year, we surveyed some of the adjacent areas. And as is shown in the map, the site seems very bounded because near the other areas, there is little to no artifact. The only field where we found numerous, like a large number of artifacts is this field here, but it's mainly medieval pottery, including some like flakes and lithic. And here is highlighted the creek that bounds off site in the north. And uh, in the picture are, so, are shown some of the a lithic that we found in 2019, including some cores, flakes, and a stone axe. And uh, considering the exciting results that we got from our survey, uh, we this summer we did the surface graded collection and we uh, had a total of 414 squares five by five, as shown in this map. We mostly covered the northern part of the site because of lack of time and due to no visibility in some areas, we were not able to site collect all the site. And uh, con considering the large amount of artifacts, we decided to count and photograph everything in the field, but collect only a representative samples for pottery and daub and bones but we collected all the lithics and all the stone axes. And uh, apart from a large number of pottery lithics, we found a winter figurine head, eight stone axes, complete grinding stones, and a lot of animal bones. And here is the breakdown of the numbers. So we had a large number of daub followed by prehistoric pottery, a large number of lithics, and a lot of historic pottery and other which included either grinding stone, bones, glass object. And here below is a picture of how one of these squares, like what were the most like findings that we were collecting, which is prehistoric pottery, uh, st stone tools, lithics, and bones. And uh, it, together with the, our site, grid site collection, Dr. Saris, had, he conducted uh, a high resolution magnetic survey, an area of about 10,400 square meter were surveyed, the findings of which will be discussed later. And uh, Dr. Harris covered some areas that we did not include in our site, uh, in our graded collections because we had no visibility. But in the future, we are hoping to go back and do put a grid here and site collect so we have uh we have it covered all the sites that we have the magnetic survey survey results and uh, so findings i will be focused on only four of them in the lithics pottery dub and bones there was a total of uh, 1,426 lithics from which we have analyzed only 658. The assemblage included coarse blades, flakes, blade flakes of various sizes and materials. The most common material is the white chart as shown in the picture, uh, followed by a few fragments of brown, gray, and honey color materials. 
the presence of a large number of ethics strongly suggests that it was probably a lithic workshop. Future research would be carried out to pinpoint the lithic raw material, uh, raw source, and understand if they were producing them for exchange purposes. Additionally, as shown in the map, the lithic density aligns very well with the geophysic results. Wherever there is an anomaly in the geophysic results, we have a higher density of lithics. Thus, it appears that although the artifacts have been moved by plowing, the highest density still aligns with potential st structures. These results were the same for pottery density, daub, and animal bones, as will be shown in the next slide. And in the graph, there is a breakdown of the typologies of these stone tools we are finding, which was mainly blade flake, and we had like blade and cores from the analyzed assemblage. This some, and we are planning to finish the analysis later. And here is the density maps of pottery. I have divided it into prehistoric and historic. With prehistoric, I include late Neolithic to Iron Age and historic everything that comes after Iron Age. The pottery assemblage here is included only the collected fragments, and they date from the Neolithic period to the early modern period. Most of the fragments are body shards with some rings, handles, and bases. Most of the ceramic assemblage is handmade prehistoric pottery, which is dark in color with pre frequent visible inclusion and thick walls. The historic pottery has a, a lighter color, mostly reddish, and decoration, especially those dated to medieval times. Coming from a surface context, the prehistoric pottery is weathered, and in most cases, is, it is difficult to date them to a specific period with certainty. Therefore, most of the fragments were dated as being prehistoric. The presence of fragments dated to different periods indicates that the site was used for a long time. But with the present data, we don't know if the use was continuous or discontinued. To establish this, it requires further research, which we aim to pursue in the future. And here, again, we have overlaid our density maps for both prehistoric and historic pottery with the geophysic results. And the yellow stars are the location where we found the stone axis. And here in this corner is where we found the Vinter figurine. This, the highest density for historic pottery is closer to the modern houses, which might explain why we are finding them just in this corner here and not spread out farther in the sites, and uh, which is different from the prehistoric pottery, which is denser within when you go closer to the center of the site. And here is the breakdown by period. And the from pottery collected from survey is mostly Neolithic, and pottery collected from the site collection is mostly prehistoric. And uh, we have a presence of other periods like Bronze Age, Early Bronze Age, Early Modern. We have a fragment of late Roman, but this data is to be taken with a grain of salt because it's all surface material and it's dated by context. And like it, we have to have some more secure context data to be sure about the periods of the sites. And here it's shown how the prehistoric pottery looked like in the historic. As I mentioned, the prehistoric pottery is mostly dark in color and it's thick walls with visible inclusions in the surface. And the historic pottery, it's lighter. And uh, here it's this Jug, I think a fragment of a jug, and here is a medieval pottery fragment with uh, this yellow strap glaze. Daub was one of the most common findings that we encountered, uh, both during our pedestrian survey and our uh, graded site collection. And uh, the sizes varied from very small brown weather pieces to large chunk. I think the biggest one was like to 30 centimeters. And uh, we did not collect it, all of them, but we have collected a large sample of daub for each grid square. And again, in the left is shown the density of daub. It's, it's everywhere 
in this type. And another uh, finding that we analyzed and uh, collected during our survey is bones. The analysis was done by the UMA student Julian Schultz. And so far we have at least eight taxa. And uh, primarily, primarily through teeth. Although not collected from a secure, secure context as with all the findings, several bones, including a deer anther, show clear evidence of intentional modification. And uh, it's surface material, but for most of them, they kind of look of being archaeological. But this, again, has to be verified by further research. This taxonomic profile goes well in line with the generally accepted profile from a Neolithic context that is composed of both domesticated and wild fauna, as shown in the table, followed by the density of the bones at the site. And uh, together with all the artifacts and the McDowell material results, here is how the site looks based on all these results. And uh, Dr. Cyrus from the University of Cyprus, he, he provided for us a very detailed report. And he indicates in his report that at least 22 orthogonal features suggest structural remains. Their dimension vary, but most of them pinpoint the existence of long houses similar to the Neolithic style houses found in other Neolithic sites in the Central Balkans. The largest of them have dimensions of 13 by 5 meters, and the smallest is 4 by 3 meters. Most of, most of them have an alignment towards the northwest southeast direction. Additionally, the results indicate the existence of a ditch, a common feature in Neolithic sites in Europe, but also in the Balkans. If there is a ditch, which we will go and test with excavation, further research will be needed to understand the role of this ditch. Was it part of a defense system or was it was the role as a space separation from inside the site versus outside the site? And the ditch is shown with the red lines here, highlighted by Dr. Saris for us. And uh, we'll, sorry, we'll go back this summer with some goals in mind. Hopefully we'll be able to do the work. First, we have to complete the analysis of the collected materials from the site collection and conduct some text test excavation in the one to test the geophysic results and see if those that shown in the report are houses and then kind of have a sense how deep the site is, how many occupation are there and make a sense of also for all the data that we have collected so far and get the sense of like better chronology for the site and do chemical analysis of some for some of the materials. Also, we plan to look for the material source for the lithics and see where they were taking it and then try and see if they were exchanging it, how far was it going? Like, was it going to nearby sites or like to farther sites? And then put the site in broader context and see its role and its relationship to the region of Western Kosovo, but also beyond that. And uh, finally, for I want to thank the directors of the project for making me part of this amazing project, Dr. Michael Galati, Dr. Haji Memetai, and Ms. Silvia Deskai, Dr. Apostolo Saris for his amazing report and the work he did in our in the site, Irina Batsi for the maps, Julian Schultz for the final report, and the Rapid K team, especially Team E and Team H that always worked so hard and did all this amazing work in the project. And also the amazing people of Peya and this talk for their hospitality and for all the coffee and raki that they give us in the field. And here is this heart-shaped coffee cup that the family brought us in the field one day for us to have coffee. And now I'll we'll pass it to Arina. Thank you, Jani. 
I just need one second to set up. I love that photo of the coffee mug. It's one of my favorites. Okay. Um, can you see my screen or no? Let me try that again. All right. I think this will work. Awesome. Okay. I think it's working now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, before I dive into my portion of the presentation, I do uh, very briefly want to acknowledge that I am coming to you today from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor campus on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Wyandotte peoples. Uh, with Mike and Johnny laying down uh, most, most of the groundwork, um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of dive right in today and talk about how my research and how it relates to the RAPID project more broadly. So overall, um, I'm interested in questions of mobility and settlement, uh, the how and why people move within their landscape. These are questions that are very pertinent today and core to what it means to be human. Moving is something that as a species, we are pretty good at. And in the present day, something that a large percent of the population have to think about uh, whether it's their choice or not. So as you see on the slide in front of you, I have noted here interaction and landscape. And while I'm interested in how people interact with each other and the landscape, uh, as of now, I don't have much data yet to get at interaction. This is data which I hope to get through future uh, research. So today I'm gonna to be focusing more on the landscape and on that end, more on geographical and physical constraints for the time being, since this is the data that I have access to. I always think it's good to start with a definition uh, so everybody's on the same page. Uh, so you're gonna hear me talk a lot about hill forts. And what I mean when I say hill fort is um, a typically fortified or naturally defended site that's located at a heightened elevation in the landscape, usually on a plateau or on a slope of a mountain. In the Balkans, there is a rise of these types of sites in the Bronze Age. Uh, and in Albania, they are argued to be characteristic of the settlement pattern in the Iron Age. In prehistory, they tend to have dry stone walls. Um, however, many of them are reused over time, and the walls are straightened and refortified and added to. So you may be wondering of all the sites you can choose to analyze why hill forts. Um, while we've made a lot of progress to our understanding of tumuli in the region, uh, with systematic excavations, bioarchaeological analysis, and new interpretive theories applied, um, some examples include uh, Lofkend, uh, tumuli 9, 10, and 11 at Apollonia, and tumuli 88 and 99 at Shkrel and Shtoy, respectively, in northern Shkodra. The same cannot be said for our understanding of hill forts. And pun intended, our understanding of hill forts has kind of remained a little bit flat. With a few exceptions of Hernandez, the, uh, the work done by Hernandez et al. in Butrint in 2020, and the work done by Galadi and Bekel and Shkodra, which is forthcoming in the Posh publication. So there's still a little bit more work to be done to uh, enhance our understanding of pilforts in the area, especially in Kosovo. So this uh, brings me to uh, my research questions, why I'm in interested in hill forts. So broadly, I'm interested in the role that hill forts may have played in the larger landscape in the Balkans, specifically in Western Kosovo and Northern Albania during the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age. And this broad question can be broken down into several sub questions. For example, are these sites part of a larger settlement system? Are people using these sites as refugees or only in times of stress and danger? Are they even full time settlements? And are the people who are using them uh, sedentary or mobile? If so, if they are mobile, who is moving, what is moving, and where are they going, uh, and multiple other questions that I hope to get at in the future. So to kind of put that all together more succinctly, uh, with my research, I hope to evaluate whether hill forts in the region of Dukajin existed as strongholds in times of sociopolitical conflict, and therefore operated in isolation from or in competition to each other, or if they were part of a larger settlement system and were multifunctional, including but not limited to their use as places of refuge. So I'm going to dive into some of the preliminary work that I've had the privilege to carry out over the past two years. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, data, uh, three main data sets, uh, that being systematic pedestrian survey from the RAPID project, the geological, uh, geo, geo, yeah, the geophysical survey, the magnetometry survey that was conducted by Dr. Apostol Lasaris from the University of Cyprus, and the surface collections that we conducted this summer with a wonderful team of Albanian archaeologists. The methods that we used were very similar to the ones Johnny described, so I'm not going to get uh, into them very deeply. 
In terms of the analysis that I used uh, or that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to be sharing with you some of the preliminary artifact analysis and some of the very large scale geographic GIS analysis. And that will include the view shed analysis I ran, which calculates an area visible from a viewpoint using a DEM or digital elevation model and the least cost path analysis, which calculates the easiest path between two starting points using a cost raster. In this case, one that represents slope. So again, as I mentioned this summer, I had the privilege to work with a small team of Albanian archaeologists at three sites, Vrel, Luboj, and Surigan, which represent three out of 10 hill forts in the region of Dukajin, located on the mountain ridge that rings the plain. These sites were selected uh, because they provided evidence of con uh, containing prehistoric components, specifically dating to the Bronze Age, um, and because of their proximity to flat sites in the area, as well as other hill forts. So we're going to begin uh, by talking about Vrel. So Vrel is a hill fort located at 650 meters above sea level. I put here that it has roughly an area of 1.5 hectares. This is an estimate. Um, the size is difficult to get at because portions of the site are overgrown with trees and shrubs. The site itself is incredibly steep with very little soil preservation and large uh, areas of exposed bedrock. However, there are still walls visible on the surface. And one of the reasons that we visited this site or that I decided to revisit the site is um, that we actually found Bronze Age sherds when we were surveying up there in 2018 in the first season of Rapid. So here are some of the results from the surface collections. Despite being very steep and annoying to get up to, we were able to conduct 86 uh, surface collection units, five by fives. Um, some of which were non-surveillable uh, due to the high percentage of exposed bedrock. Um, however, the area where we conducted the surface collections yielded mostly later ceramics dating to the late Roman and antique period with very few um, uh, units yielding prehistoric periods. And if you can see my cursor, here's where some of the Bronze Age shirts came from, kind of localized up here, whereas the historic shirts dating to the Roman and later periods were kind of spread out over the site. Uh, because of the very poor soil preservation at the site, we didn't bring the mag up there. It wasn't uh, <laughs> worth it, but I did do a little bit of GIS analysis to try to understand how the site looked from the large scale. Um, one of the reasons I was originally interested in this site is because of the view when you're up there. It really feels like you can see the entire plain below you. Um, but the viewshed analysis uh, that I've currently run with the, uh, the data that I have was actually a little bit disappointing. Uh, the site actually had the smallest viewshed of the three that I calculated with an area of 146 square kilometers. So within this area of visibility, 18 known sites in the rapid area fell within it, two of which are prehistoric and actually both of them are mortuary. Uh, additionally, two newly dis uh, discovered sites by the rapid survey fell within this area, both of which were prehistoric or multi-component. One of which was the site of Luga, which you just heard about, and the other one was uh, the Lubos Tumuli II, which Mike mentioned a little bit earlier. In, times, uh, in terms of hill forts, only one of the other nine are uh, visible to Vrel, and that is the site of Dulce, if you can see my cursor right here, on the other side of the plain. So the second site that I'm going to talk about is that of Luboj um, with the toponym Gradin. So this site is the site that is located right over Pepai. It is um, a small hill fort also located at 650 meters above sea level. I put here roughly that it has an area of about half a hectare. Again, this is a little bit um, wonky because there is quite a, a lot of overgrowth on the site. So the site could actually be bigger, but this is an estimate. Um, the site has quite a bit of soil preservation as well as walls visible on the located right about Pepe um, and this collections. Uh, because the site was so small and so overgrown with trees, uh, we were only able to conduct uh, a very limited amount of surface collections. But what we did find was actually really interesting. Um, most of the shards we uncovered were Bronze Age, um, and they did coincide with uh, patches of expo exposed soil. So while the site was very grassy, 
where there was patches of soil visible, we were able to find prehistoric ceramics. The magnetometry results that were conducted by Dr. Saris were also really exciting. Uh, so what you see here before you is the strip that we were able to do in the open part of the plateau that wasn't covered by trees. Um, and outlined in yellow, you can see evidence of preserved features underground. So one of the things that I hope to do this upcoming summer um, is investigate further by uh, doing a test excavation uh, on one of these features. Uh, the GIS analysis of the, uh, the preliminary GIS analysis of the site were also really exciting. Um, and kind of surprising. So this site being the smallest in area actually produced the largest view shed at 642 square kilometers. And within this area of visibility fell 28 known sites in the rapid area, six of which are prehistoric and 10 newly discovered sites by the rapid project, seven which are prehistoric or multi-component. Ironically, uh, Pepe does not fall within the visible part of the view shed. But let me tell you, I can confirm it is visible. This is Pepe and this is the hill fort. So this is a nice reminder to always ground truth your large scale GIS analysis. Um, in addition, three hill forts uh, were visible to Luboge. Uh, that includes the Radatz, Dolce and Rel, right next to it actually. Uh, I put an asterisk by Rel uh, because the point of the site does not fall within the view shed, but a large portion of the site does. So again, another reminder, always ground truth and double check your large scale GIS analyses. Uh, and last but not least, I'm gonna talk about the site of Surigan, which is at the edge of the rapid study area. This site is located at 750 meters above sea level and is about three hectares in size. It's a really big site. Uh, additionally, this site consists of two levels, an elevated plateau and kind of rolling hills, uh, mountain foothills below it. Uh, it also contains multiple exposed profiles and depressions in the second level. Uh, as you can tell by this map, this is where we spent most of our time this summer. Uh, we conducted 207 five by five collection units. The visibility at the site ranged from zero to 100, um, and some units fell in areas where there was exposed surface profiles, and the amount of ceramics that we collected there was just off the charts. Um, the materials ranged from uh, potential Neolithic, uh, all the way up to a modern medieval and Ottoman. And they uh, consisted of ceramics, bone, stone, and even some metal. The upper level of the site, as you can tell, um, does seem to have a higher pre, uh, historic component uh, than as opposed to prehistoric, but this could be due to cleaning and maintenance practices or more recent activities uh, masking older ones. Um, however, what is really interesting in terms of the prehistoric pottery is how it kind of pops in areas where there's exposed. So down here along the path and here where you had exposed um, ditches and depressions. The magnetometry results from this site were also really interesting. So again, as you can see by the yellow outlines, there's evidence of preserved features at both levels of the site. Um, and again, something that I would really like to do this summer is conduct test excavations to see if we can find out a little bit more information about these features. The GIS analysis or the preliminary GIS analysis for this site, um, was the least surprising uh, for the most part, but still very interesting. I expected the site to have a large view shed because when you're up there, specifically on that elevated plateau, you can see the entire plain uh, before you. So within this uh, area of visibility, uh, we had 16 known sites uh, from, from the rapid region, seven of which date to the prehistoric period, uh, and 15 newly discovered sites, five of which are prehistoric or multi-component in nature. This also includes two tumuli. What was really surprising uh, with the view shed of this site in particular was that only one hill fort was visible. And out of all of them, it was the one that was the furthest away from the site on the other side of the plain. And that is the hill fort of Radat. So it seemed to me like the view shed at Surigan uh, was looking westward. And because I'm interested in questions of movement and systems of transhumans in the uh, late Bronze Age, I thought uh, it might be fun to sort of play around with some least cost paths and see 
what's an ideal path uh, from going, if you're up in Northern Albania and if you wanted to get to the region of Dukajian, which path would you take? And the results were kind of surprising. I expected uh, a mountain path because that is what the literature suggests. And that is a path that is still walked to this day. However, um, the least cost path that I ran from three sites in Northern Albania uh, from at Zagor Shkodranta all came from the south through Jakov. Um, this re these results should be taken with a grain of salt, however, because I only used one cost raster, the only data I had available to me in that slope. Um, I have no way right now of accounting for things like weather and uh, ways of practice. So something that I hope to do in the future is try to add these constraints in the least cost path analysis. So while it seems like uh, the least cost path from Northern Albania to Western Kosovo is through Jakov for one person, if only accounting for slope, I'm interested to see how this would change if it's one person and 50 sheep that they also have to take care of. So to wrap things up, I find that I have more questions than answers, but I think that's usually the case with exploratory work. Um, so it seems like REL uh, was occupied predominantly later in time, yielding a high percentage of Roman and late Roman ceramics. Luboj uh, has a positive late Bronze Age component and an incredibly large view shed. And Suryagan seems to have evidence of multiple components, uh, periods in time, with also a very large view shed. So moving forward, there are a few things that I would like to do to try to get at some answers uh, for my broad research questions. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to uh, come back to the GIS analysis and uh, rerun some of the view shed analysis using multiple viewpoints per site and seeing how this changes the results. Uh, when back overseas in Kosovo, I would also like to uh, ground truth these visibility results. I also intend to work on a model for the least cost path analysis to include constraints other than slope. Uh, this summer, funding pending, of course, I would like to conduct test excavation at Luboj and Surigan, uh, since they both provided evidence of containing late Bronze Age components and preserved features underground. As Jani mentioned, we still have quite a few artifacts to uh, analyze, so I hope to also continue uh, my artifact analysis and uh, look at forms as well as chronological types, as I think that'll be super informative to try to get out how and why these sites were used or what people were used, doing at these sites. Uh, and in the future, I would like to conduct chemical uh, analysis, specifically oxygen, carbon, and strontium, to try to get at these questions of mobility. Uh, and some absolute dates to test if these sites are actually being occupied when I think that they are. So just uh, before I wrap things up, I very briefly want to uh, thank uh, the many wonderful people that have made this research possible. Um, the co-directors of RAPID, uh, Michael Adi, Haji Fafeta, and Ms. Sylvia Deskai. Uh, I want to thank um, uh, Dr. Joyce Marcus for all of her help and edits on my proposals, uh, Dr. Apostolosaris for the wonderful magnetometry work, my amazing pilot team who hiked up multiple mountains <laughs> in the heat of July, uh, and my wonderful friends and colleagues, and of course, the wonderful people of Kosovo who welcome us every summer, and also the International Institute and the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology uh, for funding my research. So thank you very much, and I really look forward to your questions and comments. All right. Thank you, Irina. Uh, and in general, like, thank you, uh, Mike and Janetta and Irina uh, for your talks. Uh, and I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology, the Interdepartmental Program in Classical Art and Archaeology, the Departmental of Classical Studies, and the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology. Mm -hmm.